today I'm going to meditate and read from Jack Kerouac's Wake Up, A Life of the Buddha, the introduction given by Robert Thurman. What a surprise! Working on this introduction, it has become apparent to me that Jack Kerouac was the lead bodhisattva way back there in the 1950s among all of our very American predecessors. To introduce Kerouac, introducing Shakyamuni Buddha, I'm just going to be personal since I'm not a scholar of the beats and their literature, but Kerouac's interpretation of beat, that it stands for beatific, which is how I like to translate the Samboga of Buddha's Samboga Kaya, beatific body, his celestial universal bliss form, rather than for beat up those who can't take the industrial slave life with its productions and its banks and its wars. This won my heart right away, thinking of beat to mean beatific body. <laughs> beatific. Okay. Obviously, it did way back when. I just couldn't remember till now. <laughs> okay. Revolution. Since 1958, perhaps since 1058, the multifaceted, lush Indian sort of Buddhism Kerak preferred has returned to the planet from Tibet after having been lost outside of Central Asia for a thousand years. Since 1958, perhaps since 1058, the multifaceted, lush Indian sort of Buddhism Kerak preferred has returned to the planet from Tibet after having been lost outside of Central Asia for a thousand years. Indian Universal B Vehicle, Mahayana Buddhism, and its monastic university institution, vibrant communities of monks, led by scientific sages, some of them adept explorers of inner universes, who accumulated mountains of texts in vast multi-storied libraries of Alexandria, in quotes, libraries of Alexandria, were destroyed by Islamized Persian and Turkic invasions and, occupy, and occupations of the Indian subcontinent. And its great mother of civilizations was further obscured by Christianized European waves of invasion, domination, and exploitation. I don't think I ever did read uh, On the Road, that's the book by Jack Kerouac, until just now for this assignment. And I don't think I would have liked the shuffling con man aspect of the character Dean Moriarty that much. Though my own hitchhikings and frenetic New York to California wanderings beginning in 1958 and running intermittently into 1961 were somewhat familiar. I never managed to hop a freight though, and I am admire Kerouac for his knowledge and guts in doing that. A question has apparently been hanging over Kerouac as to whether he really understood much about the Dharma as if he were not really genuine in his understanding of enlightenment or some such entity. Alan Watts was heard to say that he might have had some Zen flesh, but no Zen bones, referring to the title of a work by another writer on Zen, the redoubtable Paul Reps. And Gary Snyder, who spent years in Zen monasteries and is himself today a kind of Zen Roshi master, as well as a poet, may have thought Kerak did quite didn't quite get it. 
though he remained a loving friend. There is no doubt that his tragic addiction to alcohol, which cut his life and practice short at tender 47 years of age, is evidence that whatever enlightenment he had attained was short of perfect Buddhahood, as Buddhas don't usually drink themselves to premature death, since, since such doesn't help anyone else, and that's all that Buddhas do naturally, is help others. But who can really lay claim to that sort of transcendent physical and mental cosmic transcendent mutation? In the vast psychological literature of the Buddhists, there are many analyses of the various stages of enlightenment. According to them, it is quite possible to be enlightened to a certain degree and still pray to human failings. In fact, one becomes a bodhisattva or hero for enlightenment just by sincerely resolving and vowing to become perfectly enlightened in some future life, near or far, for the sake of developing the knowledge and ability to free all sensitive beings from suffering. That is, not all bodhisattvas are celestial or divine entities. Many are human, all too human. It starts off with a, a prayer. Adoration to Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the Christian world. Adoration to Gotama Shakyamuni, the appearance body of the Buddha. A Buddhist prayer in the monastery of Santa Barbara, written by Dwight Goddard. This book follows what the sutras say. It contains quotations from the sacred scriptures of the Buddhist canon. Some quoted directly, some mingled with new words, some not quotations, but made up of new words of my own selection. The storyline follows Gautama Buddha's life as represented in Ashvagosha's Buddha Charita and in Narasu's Life of the Historic Buddha, with adornments and rearrangements. There is no way to separate and name the countless sources that have poured into this lake of light, such as the Lankavatara scripture, the Dhammapada, the Anguttara Nikaya, the Itivuttaka, the Dija Nikaya, the Majjhima Nikaya, the Theragata, the Vinaya Pitaka, the Prajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra, the Samyutta Nikaya, even Chuang Tse. Dao De Jin, The Life of Mira Larepa, the Mahayana Sangra. Oh, where was I? Oh, there it is. There is no way to separate and name the countless sources that have poured into this lake of light, such as the Dankavatara scripture, the Dhammapada, the Anguttara Nikaya, the Iti Buddhaka, the Diga Nikaya, the Majjhima Nikaya, the Theragata, the Vinaya Pitaka, the Prashnaparamita Hridaya Sutra, the Samyutta Nikaya, even Chuangse, Dao De Jin, the life of Mirarepa, the Mahayana Samgraha, in a thousand places. The heart of this book is an embellished precis of the mighty Surangama Sutra, whose author, who seems to be the greatest writer who ever lived, is unknown. He lived in the first century AD and drew from the sources of his own time and wrote for the sake of brightest divine enlightenment. I have designed this to be a handbook for Western understanding of ancient law. The purpose is to convert. May I live up to these words, to sing praises of the lordly monk and declare his acts from first to last without self-seeking and self-honor, without desire for personal renown, but following what the scriptures say to benefit the world has been my aim. Ashvagosha, first century A.D. 
So, I read a few pages of the beginning of the, of the book, and, uh, and he writes, he compresses a lot, and he, he covers a lot in a few pages, and I got to this page, like, uh, it starts, at, uh, the beginning of the actual book starts at page 7, and I got to page 11, well, I start at page 10 again. And let's see what's happened so far. Oh, he's renouncing his life as a as a prince, and and he said he he's gonna pronounce his vow, and he made this vow: I now will seek a noble law, unlike the worldly methods known to man. I will oppose disease and age and death and strive against the mischief wrought by these on man to do this he resolved to leave the palace for good and go meditate in the solitude of the forest as was the custom in those days of natural religion and he pointed out the sleeping girls uh, because uh, he lived in a palace and had uh, luxuries and comfort and lots of beautiful women, uh, beautiful girls dancing. That uh, that they they wore they wore out from dancing. They fell on the floor and started sleeping. And he pointed out the sleeping girls to Udayi, for they were no longer beautiful, with their lamentable tricks laid aside snoring sprawled all over in different ungainly positions mere pitiful sisters now in the sorrow burning globe Udai. Uh, i'm not sure who Udai is let's see alas alas maybe the king's minister Udai. because he was uh Udai the king's minister had commanded the girls to entice Prince Siddhartha with their charms. They made winsome moves, dropped casual shoulder silks, snaked their arms, arched their eyes, how do you arch your eyes? Danced suggestively, caressed his wrists. Some even pretended to be blushingly confused and removed roses from their blossoms, crying. Oh, is this yours or mine, youthful prince? But in his mindfulness of woe, the prince was unmoved. So they danced away, I don't know how, since the beginning of the day or in the middle of the day, until midnight when they were all exhausted and asleep on various divans and pillows. Only the prince was awake. It is not that I am careless about beauty, he spoke to Udai, or am ignorant of the power of human joys, but only that I see on all the impress of change. Therefore, my heart is sad and heavy. If these things were sure of lasting without the ills of age, disease, and death, then I would also take my fill of love. To the end, find no disgust for sex. If you will undertake to cause these women's beauty not to change or wither in the future, then, though the joy of love may have its ills, still I might hold the mind of enthralldom. But to know that other men grow old and sicken and die would be enough to rob such joys of satisfaction. Yet how much more, in their own case, knowing this, would discontent fill the mind, to know such pleasures hasten to decay in their bodies likewise. If notwithstanding this, men yield to the power of love, their case indeed is like the very beasts. It is but to seduce one with a hollow lie. Alas, alas, Udai! These, after all, are the great concerns, the pain of birth, old age, disease, and death. This grief is what we have to fear. The eyes see all things 
falling to decay, and yet the heart finds joy in following them. Alas, for all the world, how dark and ignorant, void of understanding. And that's when he made his vow. He vows to seek the noble law, the Dharma, unlike worldly methods known to man. So the noble law is a unworldly method. And he vows to oppose disease, age, and death. And strive against the mischief wrought by these on men. But to do that, he has to leave the palace for good and go meditate in the solitude of the forest. As was the custom in those days of natural religion. Hmm. When the king, his father, when the king heard of his son's decision to leave home and take up the holy life, he protested tearfully. No, no, me. But the young monarch said, Oh, place no difficulties on my path. Your son is dwelling in a burning house. Would you indeed prevent his leaving it? To solve doubt is only reasonable. How could, no, who could forbid a man to seek its explanation? And he made it clear that he would rather take his life than to be held by filial duty to go on in ignorance. I think that's where I left off last time. Seeing this, no, seeing his father crying, the prince decided to make his departure by night. Not only the Maharaja, but the beautiful prince of Yasodhara was beseeching him not to renounce his duties and responsibilities of royal reign and of married life. With his head in Yasodhara's lap, he inwardly grieved, knowing the suffering that his full renunciation would cause her. And he pondered, my loving mother, when she bore me, with deep affection, painfully carried me. And then, when born, she died, not permitted to nourish me. One alive, the other dead, gone by different roads. Where now shall she be found? Like as in a wilderness. On some high tree, all the birds living with their mates assemble in the evening and at dawn disperse. So are the separations of the world. Looking at his three-year-old three -year son, Rahula, the thoughts dawned that he would utter later. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Call his name Rahula a bond, for there is another bond which I must break. So his, he named his son Rahula, and Rahula means bond or attachment, another bond that he had to break. To Kandaka, his servant, in the mid watches of the night when everything was ready, he said, settle then my horse and quickly bring it here. I wish to reach the deathless city. My heart is fixed beyond all change. Resolved I am, and bound by sacred oath. Quietly they rode out the royal gate. Looking back once, the trembling prince cried, If I escape not birth, old age, and death, forevermore I pass not thus along. Master and servant rode through the forest of the night. At dawn, arriving at a spot, they dismounted and rested. You have borne me well, said the prince, patting his horse. And to his servant, ever have you followed after me with, when riding? And deeply I have felt my debt of thanks. I only know, I only knew you as a man true-hearted. But with many words, I cannot hold you here. So let me say in brief to you, we have now ended our relationship. 
take then my horse and ride back again. For me, during the long night past, that place I sought to reach, now I have obtained. Seeing that the servant was full of reluctance and remorse, <laughs> the prince handed him a precious jewel. Oh, Kandaka, take this gem, and going back to where my father is, take the jewel and lay it reverently before him to signify my heart's relation to him, and then for me, request the king to stifle every fickle feeling of affection and say that I, to escape from birth and age and death, have entered on the wild forest of painful discipline. Not that I may get a heavenly birth, much less because I have no tenderness of heart, or that I cherish any cause of bitterness, but only that I seek the way of ultimate escape. So the Buddha, or before he became a Buddha, would become an escape artist, attaining the ultimate escape. Okay, what is up? My very ancestors, he says, victorious kings, thinking their throne established and immovable, have handed down to me their kingly wealth. I, thinking only on religion, put it all away. I rejoice to have acquired religious wealth. And if you say that I am young and tender, and that the mind and that the time for seeking is not come, you ought to know that to seek true religion, there is never a time not fit. Impermanence and fickleness, the hate of death, there ever follows us. And therefore I embrace the present day, convinced that now it is time to seek. <coughs> Poor Kandapa gasped and cried. <laughs> he said, No, who said this? You should overcome this sorrowful mood. That must be Siddhartha saying to Kandaka. You should overcome this sorrowful mood. It is for you to comfort yourself, all creatures, each in its way, foolishly arguing that all things are constant. Would influence me today not to forsake my kin and relatives, that when dead and come to be a ghost, how then, let them say, can I be kept? These were words of a potential dazzling pure sage, yet coming from the lips of a youthful and gentle prince. They were like weights of sorrow to those who loved him and coveted his continuing regard. But there was no other way. His relationship with the world had to be snapped. People from the beginning have erred thus, he said, binding themselves in society and by the ties of love. And then, as after a dream, all is dispersed. You may make known my words. When I have escaped from the sad ocean of birth and death, then afterwards I will come back again. But I am resolved, if I have obtained not my quest, my body shall perish in the mountain wilds. Then he took his glittering sword and cut off his beautiful golden hair. and attached the sword together with some precious jewels to the saddle of his swift-footed war horse, followed closely after Kandaka. Do not let sorrow rise within. I grieve indeed at losing you, my gallant steed, 
Your merit now has gained its end. You shall enjoy for long a respite from an evil birth. And off he clapped them, servant and horse, and stood alone in the forest, bareheaded, empty-handed, like a Vajra god, ready and waiting, yet already victorious. My adornments now are gone forever. There is only now, there only now remain these silken garments, which are not in keeping with a hermit's life. Hmm. We've got to find a new outfit to distinguish him as a hermit. A man passed by in ragged clothes. Gotama called out, That dress of thine belikes me much, as if it were not foul. And this, my dress, I'll give thee in exchange. The man whom Gotama took to be a hunter was actually a re religious hermit, a rishi, a sage, a muni. The prince soon surmounted this as soon as the transfer of clothes was effected. This garment is of no common character. It is not what a worldly man has worn. He wandered on deep in earnestness. Late in the day, he grew very hungry. In the tradition of old, vowed to homelessness, he begged his first meal from door to door among the village grass huts. Having been a prince, he was used to the best dishes that royal chiefs could prepare. And so now when these offerings of humble food met his educated palate, he instinctively began spitting it out. Instantly he re realized the patheticness of this folly and forced himself to eat the entire bowl full. Let's stop there. Then I'll read from the beginning, next time from the beginning of that paragraph. So I'm on page 15. Right there. Yeah, bam. <clears throat> okay. I, I haven't gotten very far. And haven't gotten very far in the intro either. But that's how it goes. Maybe this, uh, any um, merits that I accumulated, may um, I give them away to all sentient beings. May this help somebody. I'll upload it as soon as I can. I got a lot to upload.